All right, everybody, good morning. morning. Thinning out again, is it midterm season? Is that why? Maybe I'm just trying to get an earlier start. So, okay, so today we're going to, we're done with CPUs. So we finished kind of one of the big major units in the class. Um, today we're going to move on to memory management, which will consume us for a couple of weeks. So we're going to talk about you know, try to motivate the problem of memory management and give you some context for some of the ideas and abstractions that are going to emerge from the challenge of, of uh, allocating and managing physical memory on the machine. So this is pretty good stuff. I like, I like memory management a lot. I think it's one of my favorite parts of what operating systems do and has some really sort of elegant and beautiful abstractions in it. So it's a, it's a neat topic. Um, all right, so, so at this point, uh, the videos for this year are all up in the playlist. You should be able to get to that from the website. Um, and we're going to start uh, backporting stuff from 2012. So uh, some of the 2012 videos will be up there too in case you guys want to watch them for review purposes. Um, the, uh, and at some point when the 2012 videos are done, then uh, I'll uh, probably take them down from the other site. But, but OK, so the midterm is a week from Friday. It will be here uh, during class time. Um, I'm going to post, actually, I think three midterms from last year. Uh, the practice midterm that I gave, uh, a sample midterm, and uh, an alternate midterm that I gave for people who took it early. So uh, the format of the midterm is going to be the same as last year. It's 10 multiple choice questions, uh, six short answer of which you choose four to answer, and two sort of longer answer questions of which you will choose one. Um, and again, you guys will get a feeling for what that's like. Uh, you know, my feeling with the exams in the class is that um, the programming assignments in this course are, are hard, and uh, I think the exams should be easier, right? So I hope the exams are fun. Uh, they're definitely not designed to be, to be too taxing, but you guys will get a feeling from what they're like from the, uh, from the samples that we posted. And then finally, uh, in order to help the TAs help me write some exam questions and also to help them grade next week, and I think after, probably the week after the midterm as well, we're going to just be tweaking office hours a little bit. So you know, keep your eye on the calendar online. That will be correct. The poster on the door is not always up to date. So like this week, Guru didn't have office hours yesterday, and I think I've canceled some of Zihe's for today and some of the Dishios. So. Uh, just, just use the calendar before you come into campus to make sure that they're happening. And we'll try to make the changes at least, you know, a day in advance. Okay, so we just wrapped up, uh, you know, our last bit of discussion of CPU, uh, you know, operating system CPU support, and that was talking about CPU allocation and multiplexing policies, specifically what we call CPU scheduling. So, any questions about that material before we, before we leave the world of CPUs behind for good? at least until the midterm. Oh, also, next Wednesday we will do midterm review in class. So the midterm will cover material up through next Monday. And I think we'll get through a couple of lectures on, on uh, memory management before the midterm, so there will be some memory management material. Uh, but yeah, so you'll be responsible for stuff up through Monday. On Wednesday we'll go through one of the practice exams together in class, just to give you guys a feeling for, for how to do that. All right, any questions about scheduling? Scheduling algorithms. Good fodder for exam questions. Easy to ask about. Important to understand. All right, so what is scheduling? Uh, what is scheduling? Paul. It's the process of choosing the next thread or threads to run on my CPU or CPUs or cores, right? Uh, why do I need to do this? Simon. Well, that's one of my goals, right? But why and specifically is the operating system in charge of doing this? Tim. Yeah, so I have, well, okay, I have to do it, right? So that's one good point. But why does the operating system have to do it? Alyssa. Yeah, okay. What, what else? I'm going for something more specific. Sam? Um, yeah, these are all good answers. But it's, yeah, so we have more threads and cores to run it on. That's part of it. And also, it's our job, right? The kernel is the, pr is the program on the system, the application on the system, that has these special privileges that are required to start and stop threads, right? 
the, and specifically the kernel is the one who handles these timer interrupts that give it a chance to run the scheduler and restart threads, right? So that's really why the kernel gets involved here. The kernel is in charge because the kernel handles these lower level interrupts and the kernel has uh, privilege access to the machine, right? All right, so I just gave away the answer to this question, but let's see if anybody was listening. When does scheduling happen, Jen? Front row, Jen. Yeah, what interrupts specifically, Chirag? Yeah, there we go. Yield, block, exit, or a timer interrupt. When the kernel decides the thread has run long enough and uses a timer interrupt to forcibly remove it from the CPU. Good. Uh, we started to get into this before, but what are some of the goals of thread scheduling? How, and, and, you know, this is also sort of how we evaluate schedulers. Peng. Goals of scheduling. Thor, you want to help him out? Bethany? Yeah, so I might want to minimize latency or responsiveness, give, cheds, bleh, give threads a chance to run frequently, right, so that interactivity is preserved. Okay, that's, that's one kind of side of it. What would be another goal, Robert? Yeah, I want to, like, uh, keep the hardware busy, right? So meeting deadlines, that's kind of what Bethany said. How often, you know, when a thread is ready to run, how quickly can I get it onto the CPU so it can do whatever it's trying to do? And then also, how completely do I allocate CPU uh, system resources, right? Assuming there's work to do, I want to keep the parts of the system busy, right? That's why you bought them and paid for them, right? Not for them to sit there idle. Um, and on human-facing systems, we're typically uh, uh, more interested in interactivity or deadline meeting. That's one way of thinking about it. Why is that true? Varun, welcome to class. The question is, on human-facing systems, I typically prefer meeting deadlines to complete optimization of hardware resources. Why? I can see busloads of people coming in from South Campus. Chirag. Too much time is more important than Yeah, so your time is more valuable than your computer's, and also you don't notice when the system isn't fully utilized, typically. Right? You, just, you just don't know. Right? And then finally, another goal of scheduling performance is just that the scheduler perform well. Right? We talked a little bit when we talked about the Linux scheduler, about old Linux schedulers that scaled with the number of threads. That's not good. Right? I don't want scheduling decisions to take that long, and I certainly don't want them to take longer as the machine gets more overloaded. Right? That's the worst thing that could happen. Okay? Two schedulers that don't use any external information about threads. So Grim, what's one of them? No nothing schedulers. Round robin is one. And then random. OK. These are, these are sort of classic examples of schedulers that use no external information, right? Um, now let's say that we knew things about the future of the threads. What would we like to know? Yeah. So I, I can accept some priorities, right? But it's not really about the future of the thread, right? That I would know, right? Because there's someone who would tell me what's the priority. Jeremy? Whether it's, it's blocked or sweep. Whether it's about to block or sweep, right? How long is this thread going to run before it blocks, right? And, and will it block or yield? Is it going to go to the waiting queue or is it going to go to the ready queue again, right? And then if it's on the waiting queue, how long will it wait, right? When is it going to be schedulable again? So. Because we can't predict the future, what do we do? Use the past to predict the future, right? We can say it lots of different ways. Use the past to predict the future, right? Use the past to predict the future. Um, that's what we do, right? Uh, an example of a scheduler that does something like this is what? We actually went through a couple of them, Wembley. Yeah, our multi, you know, our our old friend, multi-level feedback queues. Yeah. The rotating yeah, and the rotating staircase does this too, right? Because the rotating staircase, uh, you know, will put threads. You know, in, in a way, it does this. It's interesting, right? And 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 you may, you know, one of the questions that's come naturally to my mind as I've started to think about good exam questions is, 
differences between MLFQ and the rotating staircase. Right? I'll probably send out a little bit more information about the rotating staircase before the exam. Who's Ingle Molnar? Daniel. Yeah, he's the, he's the Linux scheduling subsystem maintainer and developer, at least as of last year. I haven't, I haven't checked this here. Uh, who's Khan Kalivas? Swetha. Well, that's Ingo. This, was, this is a listening to the answer that the student before you just gave. Question, Tam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how to say that word either. He's the Australian anesthetist and Linux kernel developer who, who wrote the rotating staircase and several other schedulers with fun, profane names. Um, all right, so let's go through, to just do this quickly, I think this is helpful, right? So I assume I have a rotating staircase deadline scheduler. I have a five millisecond quantum with 10 levels, right? So let's say, and let's say the levels are highest priority zero and lowest priority nine. All right, you could flip them, it doesn't matter, right? So a thread that starts in the highest priority level, which levels can it potentially run in in one iteration of the scheduler? Zoo. Uh, I missed somebody's name again. Your name is Daniel. Which levels can it run in? Zero through nine, it can run in all of them, right? It's a high priority thread, right? What about a thread that starts in priority level five? What levels can it run in? Kevin? Five through nine, right? Now, say at the beginning of time, we have one runnable thread at priority level zero, three, seven, and nine. What's the longest amount of time before the thread at level nine has a chance to run? This requires a little bit of math. It's probably difficult to do in your head, right? But I have to calculate the fact that zero, and I'm not even sure this is right, actually. Ah, damn it. Anyway, forget so that. Levels correspond to the quantum? What's that? Yeah, this is, this is wrong. Just ignore, the, ignore this part of the slide. Right, it's not, OK. All right, any questions about scheduling? Now, I will send out some more information about the rotating staircase. I realize the presentation has been a little bit lacking. Any other questions about scheduling before we? Motor on. It's your last chance. CPU questions, scheduling questions. Going once, going twice. OK, cool. So let's talk about something else. So up until this point in the class, um, you know, we've been talking about multiplexing, but we haven't really talked about different types of multiplexing. And now that we're moving on to talking about memory management, uh, we need to start thinking about different ways to share resources, right? So what we thought about primarily, especially in worlds where we think about sort of one CPU, right? But even if we have multiple cores, is this idea of time multiplexing, right? So if you imagine different ways to share a resource, right? There are resources where the way to share them is by dividing up access to that resource in time, right? So I give you some access on that resource, I give somebody else. But the idea is that the resource isn't really partitionable in any sort of meaningful way. Right? So when a thread is running on a core, that thread is using that core. It's not sharing that core with anybody else right? to, to a certain degree. Right? Space multiplexing, right? so this is you know, an example of time multiplexing, is CPU scheduling on a single core system, right? or single core, you know, allocating CPUs to cores. Right? I take a single core. I can't divide it any further. It's kind of indivisible. And so I divide it up in time. Right? I give it to one thread, another thread, and I, and I do that over time. Multiple threads have access to the same core, right? Space multiplexing is different, right? So it's this idea of I can share a resource by dividing it into smaller pieces, right? So memory management, we, we'll, you're going to find out, we do space multiplexing, and that can be done at a fairly high granularity, right? We can't necessarily divide memory down to the level of bytes, right, where I say I'm going to give you, know, you one byte and you one byte and you one byte, but I can divide it down into pretty small pieces. Right? And we'll talk about how big those pieces are later and why those pieces are the size that they are. Right? Um, another example of this, however, is just important to point out, is uh, CPU scheduling on a multi-core system. Right? So here the idea is that the granularity is much lower on a four-core system. I have four cores. Right? So I can space multiplex threads. I can uh, share the core resources by dividing them up in space, but I can only do it you know, into four pieces. Right? 
Whereas on a, you know, on a system with a couple of gig gigabytes of memory, I ha might have millions of different pieces that I can hand out to different processes, right? So, so let's talk about some kind of straw, you know, I don't want to dwell on this too much, right? But let's talk about some uh, very basic, right? So, okay, let's, let's kind of bop up to the top of the stack, right? I'm the kernel, right? I'm in charge of multiplexing resources, okay? Now we're started, we started with a completely new resource. So you guys don't know anything about the types of privilege that the kernel needs to do this or the abstractions that we're going to build up. So we're kind of starting over from the beginning, but we're going to talk about all that stuff, right? But let's just consider the problem, right? I've got a big chunk of physical memory here, right? It's the physical memory that's in your machine, right? This, this term becomes important later because we talk about a different type of memory that's not physical, right? And one way of dividing memory between processes, potentially, would be to simply take that physical memory and, and you know, give processes direct access to the physical memory in some way, right? And you might, you might wonder, don't processes have direct access to physical memory? And the answer is no. But maybe you think they should, right? So why can't I just directly divide it up between processes? The process starts running, it requests some memory, and I just give it a big chunk of memory, right? So, uh, so let's so see how that would go here, right? Um, so I've got Firefox, very skinny Firefox for some reason. And um, Firefox decides that Firefox is going to you know, take this big chunk of memory. And that's actually a pretty accurate description of how much memory Firefox seems to use, I think. Um, so you know, now I run my, my virtual, uh, virtual box because, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, I'm not watching YouTube videos. I'm working on my, you know, my CS41 assignments. Uh, so that, and that, that consumes you know, a pretty big chunk of memory, you would, you would imagine. And now I start up a terminal, and, and that doesn't consume much memory. But now I'm going to try to start up some sort of a, a graphics program, right? And that graphics program needs this big chunk of memory. And, and now what do I do? Right? So now I'm, I'm out of memory. So what, what do I have to do at this point? Well, I could wait, right? But probably, probably what would I do instead? Josh? Ooh, big borrow or steal, right? I like this. Um, I probably, well, I don't have a mechanism for borrowing yet, though, right? I just, I handed out memory, right? I'm the kernel. Firefox came along. Firefox said to me, hey, man, I need two gigs. I said, okay, here you go, right? I don't have a, like, Firefox ran off with that memory. I can't get it back, right? So what am I going to have to do? I could close something. What else could I do? Simpler option. Andrew. Yeah, I just fail, right? You tried to, ooh, hey, there's no law that says just because you clicked on something on your system, it has to run, right? A little box might pop up saying, sorry, you can't run this program at this time, right? Try closing some other stuff, right? Um, and some systems actually do this, right? Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not completely foreign to us, right? So, okay, that's not so great. So now let's, but now let's think about some of these other ideas um, that people had. So, so, but let's point out some clear, <coughs> maybe these aren't, Super exciting, right? But some clear problems with this idea of direct uh, multiplexing, right? Just directly handing out memory. So the first thing is the amount of memory that's in use by processes is limited to the physical memory on the machine, OK? And this might not seem like a real big limitation, right? Because you might say, well, isn't that true anyway, right? I mean, that is the fundamental limit, OK? But we're going to talk about some abstractions that allow processes to have actually a much more expansive view of memory than what's available on the machine, right? And, and part of our, you know, the big, the big key abstraction here that we use to make virtual memory, oh, to make memory management possible is, is going to give us all sorts of neat powers, right? And one of them is to make the machine look like it has a lot more memory than it actually has, right? Um, so here's this other question, right? So, so Josh, you know, mentioned, well, why don't we ask for some of it back, right? And the fact is that, Processes request memory that they either don't use or they use for some period of time and then they stop using, right? So what's, a, I mean, what's an example of memory that a process might no longer be using? What might be in that memory? Manish. Well, memory leak, okay. So that, let's, say, let's say that we don't have a pro programming bug, right? Let's say a legitimate case where an uh, application used some memory and then and then wasn't using it anymore. Sirak. Application when it's idle? When it's idle, OK, sure, if it's not running, right? But let's say the application is still running, right? What gets stored in memory? 
by applications. Temporary files. Yeah, temporary files are files, right? So they don't get stored in memory. AJ. It's state. I mean, and as programmers, like what? You know, this is a good question, right? Maybe we should back up a little bit. What gets stored in memory, right? What do processes store in memory? Jeremy, what's on the What's that? Thank you. Yeah. So dynamically allocated objects in memory, right? When you call malloc, that gets stored in memory. What else gets stored in memory? <coughs> even more, even more basic. Wembley. Okay, so we have global variables that get stored in memory, but, but, but there's something else you guys are missing. Yeah, I don't know. The code, the code that the application is running, right? Where do you think that lives, right? That's how processes work, processors work, right? They fetch an instruction from memory, decode it, execute it, and repeat that loop, right? So the code has to be in memory, okay? So now, again, you know, give me an example of uh, a parts of memory that a process might not be using. Sir? All sorts of parts of its code base, right? I mean, you're using Microsoft Word, right? Microsoft Word has like 68 different ways to do anything, right? You know, you chose one of them, and maybe you did it differently five minutes before, and as soon as you click on a window, it's executing some code path, and if you don't click on that window for another five minutes, that code is dead, right? That code is, is cold, and that memory is not being used, right? So all, if you look at, you know, the, the <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the, code that processes load or the code that's in the ELF file, large portions of it may not be used by any one particular user, right? There are features that you don't use. There are parts of the code that might never be executed, right? So, so the code is a particular area where there might be low, low usage, right? <coughs> Bless me. All right, so now what, you know, so now what could I do, right? So here the idea is that I'm, I'm focused on these big contiguous allocations, right? I've said that in order to give a process memory, I have to allocate it contiguously, right? So, you know, the idea is that this guy, this guy gets this big chunk here, and this guy gets this big chunk here, and this gets this big chunk here. So what, what could I do, right? I could divide it into multiple pieces, right? So for example, if Firefox exits, then at this point, if I try to launch Inkscape, which is what this is, it turns out, then <clears throat> I might be able to satisfy Inkscape's request by dividing it into two parts, right? Okay, and you might say, oh, well, this is nice, right? Now I, you know, I, now I can make sure that all the memory in the system is in use at any given time, right? Um, but then, you know, but then this causes all sorts of other problems, right? So if, you know, VirtualBox wants to grow the amount of memory it has, now it's going to collide with Inkscape's allocation, right? So. I don't know if I have to beat this dead horse that much, right? But potentially discontiguous allocations can be another really serious problem, right? It also makes it very difficult for processes to know where things are. And they're, you know, like where, you know, when you're writing a program, it's nice to know, like, where the function is that you're trying to call, right? When you call a function, you're going to jump to where that function lives and start executing instructions. How do you know where the function is, right? When you're using a global variable, it's nice to know like where it is that variable in memory, right? <coughs> if I give processes this direct access to physical memory, what happens is that these discontiguous allocations mean that every time the process runs, it's possible that things are in a different spot, right? If I ran Inkscape a few minutes ago and it was you know loaded here, then it's you know code would be here and other things would be there, but now it's got these two pieces and things like that. So this makes things very very ugly, okay? So again, I don't know if this is, you know, I don't, I don't want to beat this, you know, beat this into the ground, right? Um, but, but doing this also creates this problem with fragmentation, right? And again, just this idea of like, where are things, right? Like, you know, where is, I have this nice variable data, right? This variable is a 128 byte array, well it's not 128 bytes, it's 128 times the size of an int, lives in memory somewhere. Right? In order to perform this instruction, I have to know where it is. Right? If you look at the instructions that the compiler generates, there have to be memory addresses associated with this variable in order for me to actually access it and change it. Right? And if every time I get loaded, things get put all over the place in different places, I'm, I'm in real trouble. Right? 
So we're going to talk a little bit as we talk about allocators of various types about fragmentation. I think many people have been exposed to this idea before, right? Fragmentation is the idea that a request for memory on the system can fail, even if there is enough memory to satisfy the request, right? The reason for this is that in fre frequently, you know, because of you know, the requirements of compilers and the code that you guys write, you actually need contiguous pieces of memory. Right? You need pieces of memory that are actually contiguous, <coughs> meaning that the addresses are next to each other you know, in, in some address space. Right? The, the, the locations of the memory corresponding to that allocation are actually you know, a buddy. Right? I got to use that word. Wow. Um, and fragmentation means that I can fail a request even if the amount of memory that I need is available because that uh, memory is scattered in different places. Right? And we, we, dis, um, we discussed two different types of fragmentation. Right? So internal, how many people have heard about internal and external fragmentation before? Oh, OK. Well, maybe I need to talk, go slow down a little bit. OK, so internal fragmentation occurs when unused memory is inside existing allocations. OK? And external fragmentation occurs where unused memory is between existing allocations. Right? So let's go, we can back up here and look at an example. So, so in this case, right, let's say I couldn't, um, let's say there was no way to divide this allocation, right? And let's say it doesn't fit here and it doesn't fit here. So what kind of, but, but these two pieces are big enough to satisfy the allocation. So what kind of fragmentation would this be, external or external? External, external right, because, you know, I don't, I don't know how much memory is in use by VirtualBox, right? It's possible that it's not using most of its allocation. Right? But the idea is I have enough memory on the system, but I cannot satisfy this allocation right? because the memory is split up. It's fragmented. Right? Now let's say there's a case where uh, VirtualBox actually isn't using most of its allocation. I gave it this big piece of memory, but there's all this unused memory inside that allocation that I can't reclaim. Right? What, and what kind of fragmentation would that be? That would be internal fragmentation, right? It means the fragmentation is inside of allocations that I've already made, right? We'll come back to these ideas as we, as we go through memory management, so it's not the last time you'll hear about them. Yeah, Jeremy. About, listen, I don't know listen, but like inside a process itself, uh, <coughs> do the um, things declared on the heap have to be uh, contiguous? Like if you, uh, say you declared two, two ints on the heap, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would it go after the? It's, yeah, so that, that's a great question, right? So how heap allocators work is something that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but, but in general, uh, al allocators of various kinds. So how many people have used malloc, right? Malloc is an allocator, right? Malloc allocators have algorithms that they use, right? You guys can look at the code in your kernel for kmalloc, right? Kmalloc is what's called a a pool-based allocator that, use powers of, that uses powers of two pools, right? That allocator suffers from a certain amount of internal fragmentation, right? But it also does not suffer from a certain amount of external fragmentation. So every allocating algorithm has different pluses and minuses, right? But in general, right, I mean, the, in general, allocators always suffer from, from a bit of this, right? But I would encourage you guys to look at, and we'll talk about this more when we get into assignment three, look at kmalloc and see how it works, right? Because it's, it's pretty simple. A long time ago, when I took this class, we actually made students write kmalloc. And it was a total disaster. Um, so we don't do that anymore. Because right? <laughs> if you don't get kmalloc right, nothing else works. Nothing. Um, and it's, a po it's very hard to debug. So, OK, so we, this is how we distinguish. So again, internal fragmentation means that there is unused memory on the system, but it's inside allocations. right? And external fragmentation means there's unused memory, but it's between allocations in either case. I have enough available memory to satisfy the allocation, but I cannot satisfy it because that memory is not contiguous. Right? It's not available to me. Okay? And again, I mean, part of the reason for this is that when I have, like, when you allocate something like this in, um, in C, C does very simple pointer arithmetic internally, or the compiler does, to figure out. So when you access data, you know, 512, it takes the beginning address of data and it adds 512 ints to it, and that's how it figures out where the next memory is, right? So if that thing is split into several pieces, you're gone, 
right? This will never work, right? So things like this have to be contiguous, right? In, in, in some kind of memory. And we're going to talk you know, today and on, on Friday about, about the big, the one big trick that makes this all work in user space. Um, all right, so, so again, direct multiplexing, clearly a, just, just not a winner, right? You know, I limited amount of physical memory, I have these discontiguous allocations, and then I have all this problem with, these problems with fragmentation, right? So here's another question, right? You know, can I enforce the allocations that I hand out, right? Um, you know, is there any way to stop Firefox from just using other parts of memory on the system? And it turns out that this is actually not possible without some kind of hardware support, right? If I allow direct access to, to physical memory. I need some way for the, I need to be able to tell the hardware basically that while that process is running, here's the range of memory accesses that it's allowed to, to, to access, right? Otherwise it can potentially write and read and use pieces of memory that are actually owned by other processes, right? And then, you know, reclamation is also, is also a problem. Right? Um, if, even if I had a mechanism for doing this, right? So when we, when we talk about, you know, here, so these are basically our goals for doing better memory multiplex, right? And there's four of them, right? The first one is that I should be able to hand out memory to processes, right? I have to be able to grant, to grant requests, right? And, you know, and this happens two, in two places. The first time it happens is when a process loads, right? The ELF loader needs a lot of memory to set up the parts of the process that have to get loaded at, at, uh, at runtime, right? And then as the process runs, it's going to make other types of allocations because it's going to, you know, want to add some memory to the heap. It's going to want to grow the stack, right? So there are these allocations that happen at runtime, and then over time, processes have other ways of making allocations, right? The second requirement is I need to be able to enforce these allocations, right? These are going to sound a lot like, you know, what we talked about. We talked about multiplexing resources more generally, right? I should be able to prevent processes from accessing each other's memory, OK? Um, the second thing I'd like to be able to do is, if the kernel can identify memory that's not being used, I would like to be able to transparently reclaim it from the process without destroying the contents, right? If I destroy the contents, then I've broken the expectations that processes have about memory, right? Processes don't expect that if I write some data into that memory and don't use it for a while, then that data just goes away. Right? That, that, that would be, make it very difficult to program. Um, so I should be able to, to repurpose the memory, however, without destroying the contents. And then finally, um, I should be able to remove, I need to be able to revoke allocations. Right? There's a variety of uh, times in which I want to do this, right? certainly on exit, but in other cases. Right? So at certain times, I want to say, you know, I've allowed you to use that piece of memory for a certain period of time. That time is over. Right? We can map these requirements onto you know, the CPU uh, multiplexing that we just talked about, right? So what's the equivalent of granting on the CPU? What, is that, what does that translate to? I oh, did you? Oh, it's Akshay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but what does this mean? Like, grant, I'm going to grant the same CPU. What am I going to do? No, no, this is for CPU, right? So what does it mean to grant a process the CPU? What do I do? Andrew. Yeah, I'm going to schedule a thread, right? This is the context which is the mechanism by which I grant access to the CPU, right? What about enforcement? How do I make sure that threads don't run longer than I want them to? Yeah, I use the hardware timer, right? What about reclaiming? Can I transparently reclaim CPU resources? Does this have a good mapping? Mukta. Yeah, kind of, right? So I, I think that this doesn't really have a good analog in the CPU world, right? We'll, we'll see the difference between. So the idea is with memory, I can, I can get rid of parts of Right again, remember, remember with memory I'm doing space multiplexing. So I can get, I can reduce a process's allocation without it knowing, right? With the CPU, it's a binary thing. So I do have revoke, right? Revoke is descheduling the thread, right? It's yanking it off the CPU. You're done, right? So this is, you know, this is essentially, you know, mental mapping you guys can use to bring forward some concepts from the CPU unit, right, into memory management. So as we did with the CPU, right? With the CPU, we had this thread abstraction. 
Okay, with memory we have a similar abstraction and it's called an address space. Okay, and we're going to talk about this abstraction first and then we'll talk about how we get this to happen, right? There's a lot of nice features of this, right? So address spaces allow every process to have an identical view of memory, right? Identical view of memory for every process on the system and an identical view of memory every time they run, right? So every time an identical process runs, Regardless of the state of the system, it has an identical view of the memory on the system, right? And there's a couple of nice things that this abstraction allows me to provide, right? The first thing is it makes memory look very plentiful, right? Potentially as large as the addresses on the system can support, right? So a process might think, wow, you know, I have this four gigabyte address space, right? The process has no idea how much actual memory there is on the system, right? If a process, if this process runs on a system that has 512 megabytes of memory or 2 gigabytes of memory, the address space size is always the same. Okay, so it, it makes memory look potentially very big. Okay, it also makes it look entirely contiguous. No matter when I run, what machine I run on, what else is running, my address space starts at zero and it goes up to the top of whatever you know addresses I'm using. Right? In this case, I'm using 32-bit addresses. So in pot potentially, the top address is this 0x FFFFF. Right? It turns out that we do, we do something a little bit different to give the kernel some room, but we'll talk about that later. Right? But essentially, the address space always looks contiguous. Right? It starts at 0, and I have access to any part of it I want to all the way up to you know, the top of, of whatever address that the, that the machine supports. Right? It's uniform. Again, every time I run, it's the same. Right? Every time, and this is great, right? Because it means that every time I run, I can put my code in the same place, right? And I can put my variables over here, right? It's like every time I, I start up, I can do the exact same things, right? This is wonderful, right? And it's private, right? And, and there are ways to share memory between processes, but the general assumption is kind of like what we talked about with threads. Um, the address, the memory is private to each process, right? Without a dedicated mechanism to do IPC, that memory is mine, okay? So this, you know, these series of, uh, you know, characteristics are really nice, right? And, and, and let me try to convince you that they're really nice, okay? So again, the fact that address spaces are uniform simplifies process layout. So when processes start to run, right, they have to make decisions about, again, where to put things, right? I've got this big blob of code, right, that I need to live in my address space somewhere. Where does it go? Right? I've got these variables that are initialized when I start up. Where do they go? Right? Where do I put, uh, where do I allow malloc to allocate memory from? Right? Where do I put stacks for my threads? Right? Where do these things go? Right? The nice thing is, these uniform address spaces allow us to have conventions about where these things go. Right? So for example, if you look at your OS161 um, binaries, they always load their code and static variables starting at OX 10,000. That's just where they put them, right? I start loading my code here and I load as far as I need to go this way, right? Okay? The heap, right, which is where malloc makes its allocations from. That's where dynamically allocated variables live, right? The heap always starts at this address, right? These are the conventions that are used by your system, but they could be, they could be different, right? There's a reason why some of these things are true, and we'll talk about it in a second, right? So I use some variable for my heap, and the heap, when malloc needs more memory, right, it requests addresses this way, right? So if I start with malloc and then I allocate a bunch of big things, malloc asks for more memory going this direction, okay? Stacks start typically at the very, 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 very top of my address space, right? So in this case, it's OXFFF, and they grow downwards, right? So remember, the stack also can grow, right? What's a case where your stack might get to be quite large, right? What type of programming causes the stack potentially to get very big? Yeah. Yeah, recursion, right? You guys may have, you know, and, and if you've programmed recursion in other classes and forgot to have, like, base cases, you may have blown your stack. Right? which means that you made a stack that was so big that at some point the operating system said, there's something wrong with you. Right? It's not normal to have a stack that big. Right? And I'm just going to kill you because I don't know what you're doing. Right? Like maybe you wrote a recursive case that has like 60,000 levels. Right? But I doubt it. Right? I think you're broken. Um, so, right, so the stack starts at, at the top and grows down. Okay? 
So you guys remember ELF, right? How many people remember ELF? Yeah, it's like a month ago, right? The ELF format, and you guys can look in your kernel and see how this works, the ELF format specifies regions of the file to be loaded and where to put them in the address space, right? And again, the nice thing about this is, you know, ELF binaries can be moved from system to system, and because I have this really nice, uniform, contiguous view of the address space, they always work, right? I can always put my code at OX 10,000. It's fantastic, right? And I mean, this allows us to do some other nice things, right? So I think people know this, right? But you know, if I go back here, remember, this is all arbitrary, OK? And someone might say, well, you know, why not load the code here? Why not load the code at OX0 and let it grow upwards? Why would I start the code at this sort of high, high address? It's not that high, it's only OX10,000, right? But it's a little high. I'm going to ignore you, Jeremy, because I think you know the answer. Yeah, well, it, so it turns out, I'll give you a hint, that typically I don't load anything down here. I never load anything into this part of the address space. Why not? The kernel code's not there. It's a, it's, a, it's a good guess, right? What's a common programming mistake? Yeah. No, again, again, this memory is typically never allocated, right? What's a very common programming mistake that many people have probably made? All right, Jeremy, I'll let you. Null pointer? Yeah, how many people have had a null pointer exception when they've written a piece of C code, right? Why do you get that exception? It turns out you get that exception because you tried to access memory here that's never valid, right? If I put the code down here, what would happen if you accessed like, let's say you just started writing to zero. What would happen? You'd be overwriting some of your code, right, with garbage, right? And then your system would do something weird later and crash, right? But it'd be much, much harder to figure out why, right? You guys will do this in your kernel, I'm sure, right? In your kernel, the thing that gets loaded at zero are the exception handlers, and there's no protection, right? So I'm sure that most people in this class, assuming you do the assignments, We'll do this at some point. You will overwrite your exception handlers, and something weird will happen, right? And your kernel will die, and it'll be because you had a null pointer problem. But in user space, what we do is we just create this big area down here that's never used, right, by convention to catch null pro programming problems. Manish, did you have a question? No, no, no. We'll, we'll talk about this later. It turns out these addresses are never marked as valid, right? The system knows, so if you, try to tr if you try to access memory here, the kernel will, will cause an exception, right? This, this is a fatal exception, okay? All right, so, so here's, here's another question, right? So I start my heap here, I start my stack here, okay? The stack grows down, the heap grows up. Isn't there a possibility that they'll collide? Could, could they potentially collide? I mean, they, they could, right? But what would have to happen in order for them to meet? How much memory would I have had to allocate at that point to this process, right? Not even across the entire system. Let's say the heap starts like in the middle, right? And the stack starts at the top. This is a four gigabyte address space. So how much memory do I have to allocate before these two can meet? Like two gigabytes, right? So in general, that would mean that one of them would have to get really big, right? And it's possible, right? Especially on modern systems, but, but especially on older systems, this was just not considered to be very likely, right? On your OS161 kernel, for example, this will never happen. You have like 512 megabytes of memory, right? The system will, will probably never be able to allocate two gigabytes to one process, right? <coughs> okay. So the nice thing is that um, this makes, like I said, this makes things very simple, right? So it turns out that uh, this allows the compiler and the link or the loader to put things where they're going to find them, right? Um, there's, there's one caveat to this, which we're not going to talk about, which is dynamically loaded libraries still get loaded at runtime, and those have to be put somewhere, and the, the binary has to know where they are, and I just don't want to talk about this, right? You could, we could do like three lectures on linking and loading, which would be interesting, but off topic, okay? So I hope, you know, today the idea is to convince you that this is a nice abstraction, right? This would be a nice thing to do, right? You know, we, we don't know yet how to accomplish this, okay? Um, and as you know, how many people have ever read those, read those, how many people read new, reviews on Newegg, 
ever for products. If you don't, you should. Newegg actually has really nice reviews, right? But a classic Newegg review is like a negative will be like it didn't cook me breakfast, right? Like that's for, like that's for a product that like a, a disk drive, right? That you wouldn't expect to cook breakfast. So it's typically considered to be a mark that, the, that this, thing's, this, thing, this thing's pretty good, right? Um, so the question is how are we going to implement this, right? Like this is now kind of our goal, right? We want this nice, you know, address space abstraction. It's, uh, you know, it's, it gives this a, a really, really nice view of memory, right? And there's a lot of nice things we can do at this point, right? The question becomes, how are we going to implement it, right? So, AJ, you had a question. So, okay, so the other, yeah, the other thing I wanted to point out, right, is that, you know, for a lot, like this, this is four gigabytes, right? Right, this is a 32-bit wide address, right? On your system, it turns out that user address space is only two gigabytes, but you know, again, you guys will talk about that more and why that is. These, these sections here are never drawn to scale on these processes, right? Like, this would be an obscene, like this might be Microsoft Word, right? But this would be an obscene amount of code for a process to have, right? This would be a lot, okay? Um, so why, you're asking why is there a gap here? Yeah, so, that's, and that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the reasons that there's the gap there is, you know, the heap is put, is, the idea is to put the heap somewhere where it's far enough from the code that, uh, that I can load a fair amount of code and other things in there. But I could, in fact, actually on some systems I think the heap starts right at the top of the code, right? So when I, when I run elf, right, I load the code in there, and then I set the heap address as like the next valid address that's right at the top of the code, right? Because this part never changes. Right. The code is, is just kind of loaded at runtime, and I know how large that, that segment is, and it's not going to change during the lifetime of the process. So you're right, I could start the heap all the way down here, right? and that would give me more room for the heap and stack to grow. <coughs> okay, good question. Um, so, so here are some implications of this model, right, that, we're just, that I just want to point out before we finish for the day. Right? So because my view of memory is now uniform. It means that addresses have lost their unique meaning, right? So when we talk about memory addresses for the rest of class, especially when we talk about addresses that are used by user processes, there's, the address OX10000 has no meaning. It's meaningless, right? You have to associate it with the process, right? Because obviously, you know, two different processes that are different, that have different code, are both going to load the code in w into what they think is OX10,000, but it's not, it can't be the same thing, right? So in the future, it makes no sense to talk about user addresses without specifying a, specifying a process, right? So in order to uniquely specify a user address, you have to give the address and the process, right? So, we need a way of enforcing protection, right? So we have, the idea is that we're going to make these address spaces private, right? But we don't not exactly sure how to do that, yet, right? So just because we've contained, created these containers, I mean, clearly they're still going to be sharing the physical memory on the system, right? We have to find a way for them to do that. We have to find a way to map these address spaces down to the available physical memory. We need to do that in a way that protects the privacy and the security of data that processes put into their, into their address space, right? The other thing that happens here is, to some degree, we're, um, we're kind of encouraging processes to take this. It, it's nice, right? It's nice to be able to say to the process, hey, you have four gigabytes of, of, you have a four gigabyte address space, right? And yeah, I moved you onto a machine with two gigabytes more memory, but you still have a four gigabyte address space. But on some level, we're kind of encouraging processes to spread out, right? So if you look here, right, as somebody pointed out, you know, I've got this, I've got my heap and my stack, and I'm starting them far apart, right? Depending on how I map address spaces down to physical memory, this could be a big problem, right? Because, for example, imagine I need a contiguous piece of physical memory that's that big. Now I'm in trouble, right? I need two gigabytes of continuous, contiguous physical memory on a machine that has 256 megabytes, right? So that's, that's going to be a big problem, right? So I need a way to handle that, the internal fragmentation that's um, inherent to address spaces. Right? Address spaces are extremely sparse. Right? So a process has a view of four gigabytes of memory, but at any given point in time, it's probably 
actively using like 0.1% of that, right? So again, if I don't do this carefully, right, it's possible that I can have a lot of internal fragmentation and that would be really bad, right? So we need to figure out a way to solve that problem, and we will, right? Um, so on Friday, we'll talk about address translation, which is the, the, the hammer that solves, that, that pounds in all of these nails, right? Um, uh, levels of interaction, and we'll start distinguishing between physical and virtual addresses. So I will see you guys on Friday. <coughs>